Let's talk about p-value and finding statistical significance. If we go back to the problem where a student claimed that, hey, on average, there's less than 100 minutes spent on social media by students that are using social media. Well, we write down the claim in terms of that parameter mu, then we write down the complement to that. So very important, one of these things has to be true and one of these statements has to be false. Now the one with the condition of equality becomes the null and usually we just collapse it down to that the mu equals 100. The alternative is the one that doesn't have it. Now the reason that we want to have the null be the statement with equality is so that we can assume the null is true and go to a sampling distribution where we would assume that 100 is the true mean. That allows us to get probabilities. So it gives us a reference distribution to work from. Okay, now, either the null is true or the alternative is true. That's what we have to go with, either the null or something above it. So here's the deal. Either that sampling distribution is correct or there's a sampling distribution where the mean is somewhere below the 100. Now what we have to do is we have to decide based on our one and only sample that we take, how is it behaving? Is our sample suggesting that the null is true or that the alternative is true? And so basically we can look at it like this. If we get a sample mean right about here, well, that's not very far below the 100. That's a very typical sample mean if the true mean is 100. So it's more likely that it comes from this distribution where we assume the null is true rather than where it would fall on this distribution uh, way at the upper tail. However, if instead we took our one sample and we got a sample mean way down here, that's a pretty unusual result coming from a sampling distribution where the true mean is 100. If we got a result way down there, that would be a much more typical result coming from a population where the true mean was less than 100. So that would tend to make us believe that the alternative is true. So there's two explanations for getting a result way down low. Either it's due to chance, random chance, and the null is true, the, the mean really is 100, and this result is due to random chance, or the alternative is true, and the reason we got such an unusually low result is because the null is incorrect, the alternative is true, and we got a more typical result coming from a population where the alternative is true. So, two hypotheses, the null and the alternative, and two potential reasons for why we, we might get such an extremely low statistic. The one reason, hey, the null is true, and we can explain this as happening just due to random chance. Or the second reason, the null is not true, the true mean is less than 100, we're dealing with the sampling distribution down here, and the reason we got such a low result is because that would be a much more typical result coming from a population where the mean is below 100. So two hypotheses and two explanations for why the result is down here. But we're using the scientific method and we want to be objective. We know we can get some chance fluctuation and we need to prove our conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt. So we have some standards set for um, how unusual this has to be before we can leave the null and go with the alternative. So we're innocent until proven guilty. We're null until proven alternative. We need uh, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to cause us to conclude that this result is not due to random chance. It's much more likely that it's due to the alternative being true. Taking that a step further, why do we use this alpha level of 0.05 by default? Why is a 5% level of significance typically what we go with? Uh, that's the alpha, alpha level, there's a one tail test. Here's the reason why, is 5% is 1 20th. So that would mean if we get a p-value below 0.05, then our result, our statistic, our x bar, uh, x bar, is something that should only happen in one out of every 20 or more samples. So if we take one sample and we get a p-value below 0.05, that indicates an unusual sample result coming from a population where the null is true. Uh, it should only happen one out of every 20 or more samples, so that's unusual. So we would reject the notion that our result down here would be due to random chance and that the null is true, and instead we would go with the notion that it's much more likely that our result being so low came from the 
notion that the alternative is true and that the true mean average for the population is less than 100. So do we attribute it due to chance or do we attribute it due to the mean average being less than 100? But we need to hold ourselves to a standard. This is the acceptable standard. You know that we can adjust the significance level, the alpha level of the test, depending on how um, critical or important or delicate our results could be as far as the decision making process. So if we go back to this notion, how do we calculate the p-values so that we can ascertain as to whether we conclude it's due to random chance or due to the alternative being true? We assume that all is true so that we can have a sampling distribution to work from and calculate a probability of a result being at least as extreme as the sample statistic, in this case the mean that we got. Literally, it's conditional probability. This is why we spend the first uh, portion of time in a stat class learning the foundations of probability so that we can be objective and follow the scientific method when we do inference, when we uh, do a hypothesis test. So this is the probability of a p-value. It's the probability of getting a statistic at least as extreme as the one we got given that the null is true. So we assume the null is true all the way through the problem till the very end. So if the null really was true, hey, let's explore how unusual is the result that we got. Well, if the null is true, let's go find a t-score. Let's go find a p-value. And that p-value will be the likelihood of getting a result at least as extreme as the one we got due to random chance if the null is true. So that gives us the likelihood that our explanation for the extreme result is due to random chance and the null is true. Remember the other explanation is that the null is not true, the true unknown mean is somewhere below the 100 and that's why we got a result. So if the p-value is very small, uh, smaller than the established significance level of the test, then it's not likely that the explanation for it is that random chance occurred in the null is correct. The more likely scenario is the alternative is correct and the explanation for the low sample mean is that the true mean is below 100 and the sampling distribution might look something like this. Now we want to phrase our conclusion correctly. Uh, one of the things we learn in AP stat is that you've got to be thorough with your conclusion and as a statistician you want to say things in a way that people not comfortable with the stat lingo will understand what we're talking about. So in phrasing the conclusion my suggestion is focus on the alternative. So in our minds we say okay well remember the alternative would be that the mean is less than 100. So if we say hey we reject the null, small p-value, uh, probably of a type 1 error is less than 0.05 or whatever the alpha level was. If we reject the null, then the evidence suggests that the alternative is true. The evidence suggests that the mean time, uh, mean minutes spent by teens on social media daily is less than 100 minutes. But if on the other hand we get a big enough p-value that eh, we, we can't reject the null, if we fail to reject the null, then again, focus on the alternative and say that the evidence fails to suggest that the mean is less than 100 minutes. If we do that, then we're less likely to get tongue-tied, say something we don't uh, really want to say, and lose points on the AP. We don't want that to happen. So, if we had a few examples like this, suppose we were testing a proportion, and the null was that uh, 75% of college students seeking a bachelor's degree will complete the program in four years, uh, um, four years or more. And, uh, and then we say, well, the alternative is that more than 75% of students are taking, uh, let's say, more than four years to complete the program. I just said that wrong. So one more time. The null would be the proportion is that 75% per uh, of students take more than four years to get their bachelor's. The alternative would be that more than 75% of uh, college students would take more than four years to get their bachelor's. So if the alpha level was 10%, let's say, and we got a p-value of 12%, then it's not unusual enough, it's not extreme enough for us to reject the null. So we fail to reject the null because the probability of a type 1 error is too high. So that would mean, again, focus on the alternative, 
that the evidence fails to suggest that more than 75% of students are taking more than four years to get a college degree. Fail to reject the null, evidence fails to suggest the alternative. If we go over here and we say, well, let's suppose we're talking about the mean starting salary of a computer programmer and right out of college, and somebody would say the null is that the mean is 50,000. Now the alternative is a two-tailed alternative that the mean is not equal to 50,000. Suppose we ran this test at a significance level of 0.05, and we got a p-value, probably of a type 1 error, of 0.07, of 7%. Well, because the probability of a type 1 error was more than 5%, we again would fail to reject the null. So then we go to the alternative, we say the evidence fails to suggest that the mean starting salary for programmers is anything other than 50,000. So get, say it like that, that the mean is anything other than 50,000. So the evidence fails to suggest that the alternative is true. But if on the other hand, we got a very unusual result, uh, let's say 0.02, so we assume that all was true, we had 50K, 50 k, 50,000 here, and we got a pretty extreme sample mean that's not really behaving like the null is true. We got a small probability of a type 1 error. Now we reject the null. And if we reject the null, then we're going to say, okay, we go back to focus on the alternative. The evidence suggests that the mean is something other than $50,000. So the more you can understand if p-value, how it ties together to the theory behind testing a claim that we have two, uh, two possible um, conclusions that a mean is 50,000 and it's not 50,000. If we get an extreme result and we think the null is true, we're explaining the extreme result as being due to random chance. But if it's extreme enough that we don't explain the extreme result as being due to random chance, we say that it's due to the fact that the alternative is true and the mean is something other than $50,000. So, good luck.